Wes Anderson as an opening act. That's really hard to follow. Um, but I come here as a dog scientist. I actually study dog behavior and cognition. I have a lab where we do behavioral experiments at Barnard College in the city. Um, and so I'm bringing a kind of um, scientific fact check perspective to Wes Anderson's movie. In fact, before I was a scientist, I was a fact checker at The New Yorker. And so it's like deep in my blood to look at the facts of the matter. In fact, it's kind of with a little bit of thrill and trepidation that I ever sit down to a movie because most movies have dogs in them and I can't help but look at the dogs and see what the dogs are doing. So I'm gonna highlight a few things from um, I Love Dogs and see if they catch your eye. And maybe when you go and see it again, um, you'll look at it this way. Um, okay, so we're gonna do a little, how is it in the movie and um, what's the science of this? Actually, so in I Love Dogs, exiled dogs live on garbage. This was a, kind of an amazing turn on Anderson's part, it seems to me, because in fact, one of the most prominent theories of domestication of dogs is that those proto-wolves lived among humans, lived near humans, and started scavenging on our trash heaps. So that domestication began because we started living in settlements. Some less fearful wolves came around the settlements, saw the trash that we like now, just throw outside our homes, kind of, and start scavenging on that trash. So in fact, it really recapitulates something that happened in the history of dogdom. Uh, Isle of Dogs, there was a war in between dog people and cat people for millennia. Likely true. <laughs> Actually, I don't know anything about the science about this, but an interesting fact is that there is this world, and I know a lot about it because I study dogs, that thinks that, well, um, dog people and cat people um, are essentially different, and dogs and cats can never be friends. I know nothing about people, but I do know that both dogs and cats actually have this interesting behavioral flexibility, where if they're exposed to members of other species early in their development, they come to have attachments and bonds with those species um, as equally as if they were interspecific. So dogs and cats can be friends. It is the humans who have a problem with it. <laughs> okay, dogs talk. Uh, nope. <laughs> we know this already. You don't need a scientist to say this. But I think this was a really interesting feature because, in fact, having dogs be voiced is one of the most long-standing tropes of dog films, right? That the dogs speak. And I think one of the best turns in his film was that he had the dogs, um, the humans, be incomprehensible to us. Kind of what the dog's experience would be like, right? We're always talking, we're always jabbering, and we're talking to the dog as though they should understand, and they kind of can't, and they kind of can't come talk back to us, but I think that was a really lovely turn. Dogs don't understand our language, but still largely get us. In fact, this is the case. I mean, most of the time when we're talking to them, it's just continuous noise above their heads, and then once in a while we turn to them, say some specific words, and expect them to understand. Weirdly, they eventually do get our meaning. I think this is because they are what I consider kind of canine anthropologists among us. They're really good observers of our behavior. One of the things we've learned about dog cognition is that unlike any other non-human animal, they're really good at looking us in the face and seeing our eyes as attentional cues, as bearers of information, and watching our points so that not just looking at our finger, but looking at whatever we're referring to. So they actually do get us pretty well because of their constant attention to us, despite our inability to really communicate well with them. Okay, the dogs of this movie were named Rex, Sport, Chief, Boss, etc. Um, this is actually a point of science. It's rarely the case, actually, that we name our dogs these dogs, these, these names. These are kind of archetypal, classic dog names, but I recently did 
a survey of 8,000 dog names. Um, I asked people why, what their dog's names were and why they named their dog this, and none of these names came up. In fact, what we do now is we name our dogs human names, right? Max and Bella. Are there any Maxes and Bellas in this room? Anybody have Max and Bellas? And Charlie and Lucy and Bailey. These are the real common names, and I think this is because very much now, we consider dogs members of our family. This is probably the last 50 years that this phenomenon has happened. Instead of kind of wanting to distance ourselves from dogs and name them something other. Isle of Dogs. We are a pack, this is what she said, we are a pack of scary, indestructible alpha dogs. Um, well, no, because in fact, this whole idea of there being alpha dogs is a total myth. Um, in fact, the idea that dogs had an alpha hierarchy where the alphas on top kind of in charge and all the other dogs are trying to vie for that powerful position was introduced by a wolf researcher named Schenkel in, in the middle of last century. He was studying wolves in captivity and looking at how they organize their behavior. And he determined actually they have a hierarchy where one animal is in charge and the others vie for that position. And he called that the alpha position, the beta position, and so forth. Then that became, as many kind of sticky concepts are, something that we just translated onto dogs. But if you look more carefully at who we studied, he was studying a population of adolescent male um, wolves who were in an extremely small enclosure. In other words, a kind of prison setting for wolves. And in fact, they formed the social hierarchy where one was on top. When people started being a lot better at studying wolves in their natural environment, when we had better equipment to do that, when we could track through GPS how wolves behave, researchers, David Meck, primarily among them, discovered that actually wolf packs are family packs. And if there is an alpha pair, that's like the parents of the family. I mean, you're in charge as a parent, but the kids aren't, um, some kids accepted, trying to vie for the position of being in charge of the household. And similarly, dogs are related to wolves. They're a decent model for considering dogs' behavior. Dogs are not trying to be the alpha of a household. This is a long debunked term um, and really isn't applicable. Isle of Dogs, <laughs> Nutmeg says, he's a 12-year-old boy. Dogs love those. Well, dogs do have a kind of sometimes inexplicable love for humans. I will say that, kid humans included. Um, but children are sort of tricky for dogs, even though this is the reason why many families get dogs. Children are unpredictable behaviorally, and that's difficult for dogs because they really rely on the habitual behavior of persons to understand us since we don't speak their language and they don't speak ours. Um, and in fact, this behavior, the hugging behavior, is a way that a lot of kids get in trouble. This is responsible for a lot of dog fights um, because dogs do not intraspecifically inter hug. And many times if you look at, in fact, he's doing a pretty good example of it right there, Chief. If you look at the behavior of dogs when they're being hugged, it's a behavior of like, you know, patient submission, but not pleasure. It's affection for us, but it's not affection for dogs. I love dogs. Dogs use your, their eyes meaningfully. This was a fascinating example, and maybe something that people notice, but in these, all of these dogs have a prominent white sclera, just like human eyes, right? We have very distinct white sclera, so you can see our iris, so you can see which way we're looking, we don't have to turn our head, and we can really give each other the side eye, right? Like that's a pretty expressive move. Dogs don't primarily give you the side eye, and it's because um, they love us, but also they don't have those prominent white scleras. If they want to look to the side, they turn their head to the side. But Anderson's thought this was an uh, clearly thought this was a very expressive way to represent the dog's face. So he had this expressive eyeness. It's really not doggy. In fact, dogs are primarily olfactory creatures. They're creatures of the nose. 
they will sniff something before they will see it. And even if they recognize something visually, they'll sniff to confirm what it is. Um, of course, their eyes also tear, which wasn't the case. Um, but we'll put that aside for a second. I love dogs. Dogs can sniff out that a robot dog is not a dog. True. That's true, as a matter of fact. Um, if I was, you know, it's very hard, and I'm really interested in the, to under, hard to understand the olfactory world of the dog. But given that they're primarily olfactory, I'm really interested in, and I hope someday there is some movie that decides to be all about what it would really be like to smell the world, because that's how they experience it. They were in this room, this room, that's how they experience you, that's how they experience their home and their environment. Um, and in this movie, there was almost no sniffing. There were basically two sniffs. Um, Chief sniffs out that the robot dogs are not dogs. Excellent. Um, in fact, we use, in some of our experiments, we use life-size stuffed dog models um, to sort of gauge reactive or aggressive behavior of other dogs. And they're often used in shelters as a kind of temperament test for dogs before they rehome them. And, um, Dogs see the dog, they're interested in the dog, but as soon as they sniff the dog, they know it's not a dog. You know, they treat it like a toy. But in Anderson's movie, the dogs almost never sniffed. Out, apart from Chief sniffing of the robot dog, there was no sniffing. The only sniffer were the robot dogs, which seems to me, you know, they were tracking Atari or tracking the, the kidnapping dogs. And it seems to me that that's a testament to how hard it is to understand or to even imagine what it would be like to um, smell the world first. Okay, finally, dogs walk like humans. So interestingly, Anderson made a choice, um, and he talked about this, I saw in a recent um, Times piece, his animator made a choice to instead of having um, you know, regular dog legs, to have basically two sets of front legs on the dogs, because it allowed them to walk um, in a way that was easy for the animators to move around. Um, but it's not a very dog-like walk. The dog gait is more kind of disorderly. That's how researchers would describe it, where the back left leg will go, and then the front um, left leg will go, and then the back right, and then the front right. So the back legs are always kind of chasing the, the front legs. Um, but the dogs in the movie had this very human-like, what we would call a pace, where both left legs move together and then both right legs move together, and so forth. And some dogs do that. Often that's a weak dog or a puppy, um, but not, that's not a typical gait. It's not the most efficient movement for dogs. So this was not very dog-like to me. Um, oh, Oracle can see the future, or at least the TV. Um, in fact, you know, she looks like the kind of pug, brachycephalic dogs like pugs who have this short nose. Brachycephalic just means short skull. And we have bred some dogs to have really short noses. Um, and the result, and often to have wide set eyes. And the result is that there's actually been a change in their retina, which allows them to see things a little differently than the long nosed dogs. So they have more. Um, retinal cells in the center of their eye, an area called the area centralis, than long-nosed dogs, which have more across the horizon. So pugs and other brachycephalic dogs are really good at focusing on the thing like right here, sort of more like us. Long-nosed dogs are much better at focusing on the thing like bouncing along the horizon. This is why you don't see the pugs, you know, doing a lot of rabbit chasing and you don't see the long-nosed dogs um, sitting on your lap gazing into your face, as a pug might do. So this was a kind of clever turn. Also, dogs can see TV now. Before it was digital TV, their eyes actually weren't equipped to see the televisions that we would have. They would have a flicker because the rate at which they turn the snapshots we take of the world into fluid motion is faster than ours. Um, our flicker fusion rate is about 60. Snapshots a second, we kind of take 60 pictures of the world every second and our brain makes it into a moving image. And dogs is about 80. So they would see an old film going through an old projector, you know, with all the lines between it, as though everything was slowed down. With digital TV, that's not the case in your dog. Your pug can sit on your lap 
and watch TV with him. I love dogs. Dogs are gorgeous and deeply cool. I think that's absolutely true. Okay, thank you very much. smell. So even though that's not part of, and we don't feel like places smell, but you know, this 
place has a smell. All of your seats have smells, and they have a little bit of your smell on it, even the cleanest of us. So if you have the acuity that the dogs do, which is they have hundreds of millions more olfactory receptors than we do. You know, they have a whole other organ in their mouth um, called the vomeronasal organ that's just for smelling. Um, they sniff, you know, 10 times a second which is really different than we do. If that's your primary <coughs> sensory experience, then probably it's really easy to notice when you pass by some place that you've smelled before, just as we visually recognize something. Um, so back to the visual recognition. Yes. My dog, who's never seen an elephant or a horse or anything like that, when yeah. they come on the TV, yeah. she gets crazy excited and barking at them. How do they recognize that that's something different than a person or another dog, or a cat, how do right. you know that's an animal? You know, I've always thought that, like, smell TV would be the TV for dogs, right? <laughs> Nobody's invented that? I can't understand why. Um, but I don't know that that's what's happening if they're excited, right? Like, it certainly moves like another quadruped. Dogs are interested in moving quadrupeds, but they're, they also are interested sometimes in plastic bags floating in the breeze down the street. You know, they're noticing something different, usually, when they do that kind of crazy excited barking. Um, so I don't know that I would be able to say, based on that, that, that she's recognizing anything, right, as different or unusual, except for that its novelty is probably meaningful to her. Um, when, if ever, should a dog licking a human be considered to be affection toward the human, like as in a kiss? Right. And, and how do dogs show affection for one another? Uh, is it ever by licking? Oh yeah, that's great. Licking, dogs use licking um, in a couple of ways. One is as kind of a greeting. One is to get more olfactory information because uh, that, that vomero nasal organ I was mentioning, it's in the roof of their mouth. And the only way, it, it can detect hormones and so forth. The only way that odorants can get there is by being absorbed through the tissues of the nose or the mouth. So licking something is actually just a way of trans, it's not a way of eating it. When they lick urine, for instance, of another dog, they, if your dog ever does that, I don't know, my dog does that, um, is a way of transferring the odorants into the vomero nasal organ and getting some information from it. Um, but to, to your question, um, there is this interesting tale of, you know, if you look at their ancestors, wolves, you look at how they lick. Well, in those family packs, often what happens is some dogs go off for a big hunt, they return dogs, some wolves go off for a big hunt, they return to the pack, and when they return, all the other wolves kind of mob around them and lick their face. So that is a greeting, clearly, um, but it also prompts the hunting wolves to regurgitate some of the food that they have just hunted. And that's actually how they transfer the food to the remaining wolves. So I think it's two things. It's sort of a greeting. Um, you've returned, you've come back. It's a sort of interest in, in your inf olfactory information. Also, it's a request for your sandwich. <laughs> you make more questions. My youngest daughter wanted to know how deep into the ground a dog can smell. Oh. And then uh, my question would be, my daughter plays accordion and our dog howls along with it. Yes. Is that the recognizing music or just? Right. Okay, so two rude questions. I'm going to hit your accordion one first. Um, I don't know. We don't know the dogs recognize music. I mean, they're interested in sounds. And the howling behavior, which is, it comes from wolves, and a lot of hounds do that, do that. It's considered an affiliative behavior. So your dog does feel like they're like jamming with you. <laughs> Maybe not in the same musical sense, but like you're doing something together. Um, and you could probably really easily be encouraged to do more. Um, as to the question of how far underground, I don't know that we've really tested that. I can tell you that I met a, a dog named Tucker who is trained as a scat detection dog. A scat is just a way of saying, you know, animal wildlife poop. And the reason that researchers use poop detection dogs is that they're trying to figure out a population of animals and they can't see them. The animals, you know, it's over hundreds of thousands of acres or um, in the sea. And this dog, Tucker, helps researchers find orcas in Puget Sound because he can smell when they um, poop about a mile away, about a nautical mile away, through the water. And he points in the direct, points the researcher's boat in the direction of 
the poop and they find the orca and then they can um, get the sample from it. So that, at least a mile in the water. I don't know about in the ground. Oh, sure. Right, right, it's totally fine. I mean, if you look at dogs playing with each other, they do this interesting turn role, role play where they t take turns. One will be the kind of aggressor. If one's stronger, they'll often stop being the aggressor and lie on their back so that the play can continue. They trade off those roles between being um, the more dominant one and the more submissive one. And you can also be a part of that kind of game. I mean, I think the best play with your dog is one which kind of re, uh, imitates or recapitulates what dogs do with each other. And since this off the dog idea is really um, not something one needs to worry about, it's not a posture where the dog is then gonna be like, now I'm in charge, man. Now, you know, now I got you. It's just play for the dog, if you're willing to be licked all over. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Make it a good one. Nice question. <laughs> No, no, no stress. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> My wife and I have a, uh, a dog, and sometimes when he's asleep, he'll howl or bark or sometimes look like he's trying to run while he's laying sure. down. So I guess it's two questions. <clears throat> One is, uh, are dogs able to have nightmares? And two, if they are, if you feel as though your dog is having a nightmare, should you try gently wake them up, or pun intended, let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> so, I feel like you might know the answer to this question. Do you think they're having a nightmare? I don't know, that's why. <laughs> no, but, I, well, so, I mean, dogs definitely dream. They have, their brains work extremely similarly to ours. The differences between our brains are trivial compared to the similarities, fundamentally. They def, and the behavioral things you see, the howling, the toes moving, Sometimes you'll see dogs snarl or bark in their sleep. They're dreaming. Insofar as they're dreaming, they probably have, could have bad dreams, right? Um, their, their dreams are probably similar to ours. Nobody has studied that yet. So here is a place for all of you budding canine scientists <laughs> who want to go into studying dog dreams. We don't yet know the answer to that question, but my, my guess would be, yes, they're, they're having a bad dream. You can wake them up if you want. <coughs> I don't think they're gonna think you're part of it. They'll just be startled. They actually go through much shallower cycles of sleep and waking than we do. So when you wake a dog up, that's rarely from that deep, deep, deep sleep that we go into a number of times a night where it's really hard to come out. They're probably in a pretty superficial level of sleep, so it won't be such a big deal. All right, thank you all very much.